go ahead and make a start. Welcome to our uh, third uh, installment of Honest Answers to Big Questions. But before we get into that, let me be, well, probably not the first, but among uh, those who have wished you a very uh, happy Easter today. Uh, what a wonderful day to celebrate the fact that our God is alive. And uh, we are certainly joyful about that. Hope that you've had a wonderful day celebrating that. Uh, wherever you're uh, tuning in from uh, this evening. Well, tonight we are back, uh, for, as I said, our, our Honest Answer series, uh, working our way through our uh, four sessions, and we'll say a little bit more about that uh, at the end in terms of what's next. I'm trying to look and see. I don't think, to be honest, that there's any, uh, any new folks here with us tonight, so I, don't, I think we might be able to just skip past the provocatory introductions and uh, press on uh, with the business at hand here. So, but it's good to see uh, you guys. And uh, so, before we get going tonight and answering uh, this question tonight, what an appropriate question to answer on this day, did the resurrection really happen? Uh, we want to just uh, review a couple of ground rules. It won't take long because there are only a couple. Uh, there's going to be an opportunity uh, at the end of the presentation Pastor O'Neill is going to take us through in just a moment. There's going to be an opportunity for you to ask questions, either in response to uh, what he has shared, or perhaps something else related to the resurrection uh, that perhaps uh, uh, maybe you didn't get necessarily covered in this specific uh, presentation. Here's what we ask. Uh, we just ask that you uh, uh, remain courteous, uh, even if there's something you disagree with, I don't think that's going to happen in the group that we have here this evening, but uh, you never know. Colin gets a little uh, out of hand sometimes. <laughs> but here's, here's the big question. We would just ask that you stay on topic. We're here tonight talking about the resurrection and uh, the evidence that the resurrection actually happened. And so we would just appreciate if any of your questions could be geared at If you've got other questions about other topics, maybe top topics we've covered in previous sessions, by all means, feel free to, to ask those questions of us in the chat box or contact us uh, via our church uh, email address or our Facebook page, and we'd be more than happy to, um, to answer those questions. So I'm going to hand over in just a few moments, in fact, in just a moment, to Pastor O'Neill. He's going to take us through the presentation while he is um, talking, if there are questions that come in mind come to your mind, feel free to uh, just type those in the chat box there, or if you prefer, just wait until the end of the presentation. We'll open up your microphones, which we're going to keep muted until uh, Pastor O'Neill is finished, and then you can actually ask that question uh, live, uh, your questions live uh, to us there. So, no further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Pastor O'Neill Russell, and uh, he's going to give us an honest answer to this question. Did Jesus really rise from the dead? Well, a pleasant good evening to each and every one of you. We are so glad that you have joined us, and we look forward to having this time of uh, speaking together about this subject. And the subject matter for tonight is, did Jesus really rise from the dead? It's a very interesting question, so we're going to inspect this question tonight. Is it fact or is it fiction? Is it history or is it just really a hoax? Well, before we begin, there are some things that we need to establish. First of all, we need to establish that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the single most significant event in all of human history. Now, that's a big statement, but it is a true statement. Maybe you've never heard anybody make a statement that big before, but we must make it because it is indeed fact. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the single most significant event in all of human history thus far. Now, you may ask the question, why? Well, it is because the resurrection is the clearest and strongest evidence we have that Jesus is the Messiah, the promised Messiah, and the Son of God. He is who he claimed to be. Certainly, Jesus' crucifixion on 
Calvary, which we term as Good Friday in the Christian calendar, certainly that is a significant event. However, the resurrection is even more significant than the crucifixion because it unquestionably, I'll say that again, unquestionably proves that Jesus was who he claimed to be. It proved that not even death could hold him. You see, anybody could die, but not anyone, not just anyone can live again after death. People die all the time. People have died in the past. Unfortunately, people will die today, and unfortunately, there will be people dying tomorrow. People die all the time, but not everyone who dies comes back to life. And so that's what makes the resurrection of Jesus Christ even more significant. Although Good Friday is a wonderful day, it's a glorious Friday, it was a glorious Friday, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is even more significant than that. In John 11, 25, here's what Jesus said. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. You see, Jesus promised eternal life to those who would believe on him, and he confirmed this, he ratified this, he confirmed his ability to raise believers from the dead one day by resurrecting his own body and life from the grave. If he could raise himself, he can raise his own children. And therefore, believers in Christ need not fear death as the end of their existence. Therefore, the resurrection is the consummation and the completion of Jesus' ministry. Jesus' ministry was not complete after uh, Good Friday. No, it was not complete until he rose from the dead three days later. His ministry was complete then. And he appeared to people and they saw him. Of course, nevertheless, through the centuries, there have been self-proclaimed intellectuals who have attempted to deny that the resurrection took place altogether. And so that's the reason we're here tonight. If everybody believed in the resurrection, we would have no need to have this kind of discussion. But there are people who call themselves intellectuals, and I call them self-proclaimed because in all honesty, and I say this with all due respect, that if anybody does not believe that the resurrection took place after observing the evidence, I think it proves that that person is not really a logical thinker. Because, we, because as we go through these different scenes to, tonight, I want us to see that this is a logical step-by-step -step observation. All it takes is observation and thinking to come to the conclusion that Jesus Christ really resurrected from the dead. And those who don't, I think, are really challenged as far as logic is concerned. So in this presentation, we will carefully observe the evidence for the resurrection and decide if this event is historical fact or just a hoax of fiction. Did it take place or did it not take place? So first of all, we're going to look at proofs of the resurrection. There are three proofs, three main proofs. Uh, there are more proofs than this, but these are the main ones we want to look at tonight. First of all, we're going to look at the empty tomb, the location where Jesus was buried. We're also going to observe the transformation of the apostles, Jesus' twelve apostles, and then we're going to look at the resurrection preaching that took place at Jerusalem itself. So let's start now with the empty tomb. Jesus was the most well-known personality in Israel at the time. His place of burial was not, was sorry, was known by countless people, many people, myriad of people. In fact, Matthew, Matthew records the exact location of Jesus' tomb. He states in Matthew 27, verse 59, and Joseph of Arimathea took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, meaning Joseph of Arimathea's. Tomb. So, scripture records exactly where Jesus' body was laid. It was in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. Now, if the resurrection was only a hoax, if it wasn't true, it's, a, it's simply just a hoax, it would have been foolish for the biblical writers to invent a man of such prominence, who we call Jesus Christ, whom we, term, who, who we know to be Jesus Christ, name him specifically and designate the exact location of the tomb since the eyewitnesses would have easily 
effortlessly discredited the author's untrue claims. You see, if the gospel writers wanted to pass a hoax off as true, it would have made more sense to just be generic rather than specific because there would be people alive when these gospels were written who could actually reject their claims as untrue. The resurrection did not take place in a vacuum. People were literally alive during that time and they could have testified to the fact that this did not take place if it didn't. Instead, what we find is the opposite in Scripture. We find that both Jews and Roman sources confirm an empty tomb at minimum. Is what it says in Matthew 28, 11 to 14. It says, while they were going, behold, some of the guard, the guards were the Romans, they went into the city and told the chief priests, who were the Jews, all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders, who are the Jews, and taken counsel, they gave a, su a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers, these were the Roman soldiers, and said, tell people, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this particular story has been spread among the Jews to this day. The chief priests, they were so desperate, so desperate that they put together a story that the disciples had stolen the body. Think about this. I want you to put your thinking caps on. That's what my teachers used to tell me when I was in, when I was in school. Think about this. There would be absolutely no need for this lie had the tomb not been empty in the first place. Non-believers in the resurrection cannot bypass this ginormous problem in their logic. If, if the tomb was not empty, the preaching of the apostles would be absolutely worthless, and no one would even have listened. Christianity would have gone nowhere if the tomb was not empty. All the Jewish or and or the Roman authorities needed to do to crush Christianity at its inception was to produce the body of Jesus Christ. If they had the body, they would have been, it would have been an easy task for them, and they would have taken pleasure in performing this task. But they did not have the body because Jesus Christ had already been resurrected. In addition to an empty tomb, the corpse of Jesus Christ has never been found. Never been found. I'll say that one more time. The corpse of Jesus Christ's literal physical body has never been found. So if we say maybe that he wasn't resurrected and somebody broke in and stole his body, but then the question would be, where is the body? It has never been found. And not only that, there are no historical documents from the first or second century that even attempt, get this, attempt to disprove the resurrection or claim that a corpse had been discovered. Now, when I did the first session of the Honest Answers series, which was, can we really trust the Bible? One of the things that I did during that session was point to people in the first and second century who were Romans and Jews who just recorded history. And in their history, they recorded the fact that Jesus Christ was an historical person. Now, they didn't talk much about Jesus Christ, but they mentioned him in passing. The person who spoke most about Jesus Christ, who was not a Christian, but what wrote, wrote from the first century, was a man by the name of Josephus. I hope you remember that name, Josephus. So, there is evidence there that Jesus Christ literally walked this earth and was a real person. And I brought that up because some people say that Jesus Christ never really existed. Well, when it comes to the flip side, we bring that same situation into talks of the resurrection, I want you to know that there are no historical documents that we can find from that period where anybody attempts to disprove the resurrection or they claim that the corpse of the Lord Jesus Christ had been discovered. There's no evidence in that direction whatsoever. An attorney by the name of Tom, Tom Anderson, who was at one time a president of the California Trial Lawyers, Lawyers Association, here's what he said. He said, let's assume that the written accounts of Jesus' appearance to hundreds of people are false. 
Hypothetically, let's assume they're false. He said, I want to pose a question. With an event so well publicized, don't you think it's reasonable that one historian, one eyewitness, maybe one antagonist, would record for all time that he had seen Christ's body, that he had seen the corpse? He said that the silence of history is deafening when it comes to the testimony against the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Folks, there is no evidence there. Historically, as far as documentation is concerned, that could even attempt to disprove the resurrection. Nobody even tried to lift a finger in that direction. Secondly, let's see the transformation of the apostles now. This is a, a mammoth one, and I want you to think this one through. We hinted at this in the first session again, but I, I do need to revisit this because this is also important when it comes to the situation of the resurrection. It is recorded in the Gospels that while Jesus was on trial, his apostles deserted him in fear. None stood boldly and courageously by his side. Yet, yet according to tradition, ten out of the eleven apostles died as martyrs, meaning they were willing to give their life up for the faith. They died because of their faith in Jesus Christ. They died as martyrs, knowing Christ rose from the dead. The one apostle that didn't die as a martyr, who was John, he survived an execution. And so let's just, by way of review, look at how the apostles died again, because this is extremely important. And I want you to think about this. As I read this list off, I want you to think about this actually happening to human beings because of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is according to tradition, so this is not marked in scripture, but according to tradition, Matthew was impaled by spears in the nation of Ethiopia. That's how he died. James, the son of Zebedee, was thrown off a wall and clubbed to death. Jude was crucified by Magi in Persia. John died in exile on the island, island of Patmos. Now, John is the only apostle of Jesus Christ who died a normal death. However, they did attempt to execute John. And again, this is according to tradition. It's not written in scripture, but according to tradition, what happens with John is that they took John and they dipped him in a pot of boiling hot oil. And then they took him out. They expected him to die, but somehow, by God's grace, he miraculously so survived. So after he survived, they took him and they exiled him to this island of Patmos. And as far as we know, he died there at Patmos. But they still did try to execute John because of his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But technically speaking, he's the only one who died a normal death, if you want to put it that way. Matthias was stoned and beheaded. Philip was hung by iron hooks upside down. Peter was crucified upside down by Nero. And the reason he was crucified upside down is because Peter said, I am in no way worthy to be crucified in the same manner as my Lord. Crucifixion was already a disgusting form of, of dying, according to the folks of that time. Yet Peter saw it as an honor to be crucified, but he did not want to be crucified, crucified the same way that Jesus was crucified. Thomas was stabbed with a spear in India. James the Lesser was beheaded in Palestine. Simon was crucified in Persia. Andrew was crucified on an X-shaped cross in Greece. And Bartholomew was flayed to death by a whip in Asia Minor. So those are the cruel ways in which the apostles died. So the question we must ask is this, why were these once cowardly men willing to die such cruel, cruel deaths for their master and his message? The only explanation, and I repeat, the only explanation is that they all personally saw the resurrected Christ as scripture records, 
and it completely revolutionized their hearts and lives. That intimidating mountain of death, of the figure of death, became so small. It became as small as a grain of sand because their master had conquered it himself, thereby proving that he could also sustain his apostles even beyond the grave. That is the only thing that could have given them the hope and the bravery to die in such a manner that they did. They had to have seen the resurrected Christ, as scripture records. Under ordinary circumstances, I want you to think about your own life, just ordinarily. Under ordinary circumstances, there are few people who would even be willing to die for something they know to be true. There are a lot of things that we know in life are true, but if we're honest, few of us will die for things, put our life on the things that we know to be true. Almost, almost no one would give their lives for a cause that they know to be false. Now, sometimes people give their lives for false causes, but those people are deceived in thinking that those causes are true when they're actually, actually alive. But in the apostles' situation, they would not have given their lives for something that was a hoax. If Jesus Christ had not raised from the dead, had not been raised from the dead, there is no way, absolutely no way, that they would have been willing to die for him in such matters. Thirdly, let's look at the resurrection preaching in Jerusalem. So the apostles, they first began preaching the resurrection in the city of Jerusalem, in Israel. Now why is this significant? Well, the reason this is noteworthy is because this is the same city in which Jesus Christ was crucified. And Jerusalem was the most hostile city in which to preach this message. Enemies such as the scribes and the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were all located there. Moreover, all the evidence was there in Jerusalem for the citizens of that city to investigate it for themselves. They could see it for themselves. They could walk to the tomb if they wanted to. They could talk to people. This was not some far away land. This is Jerusalem we're talking about. It was there in front of them. Touch, feel. Lies, legends, and fabrications, they take hold in foreign lands and centuries after the event has happened. Discrediting such legends is difficult since the facts are hard to verify. However, in this case, speaking of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, in this case, the preaching of the apostles occur in the exact city of the event after it occurred. Every possible fact could have been investigated thoroughly. They could have touched, they could have felt, they could have gone. Everybody, not just one person, everybody who wanted to see could have seen the tomb for themselves. I want you to imagine with me that you and I are best friends. And as best friends, we come together and we decide that we are going to hatch a plot. What we're going to do is we're going to endeavor to spread a lie as far across the world as we can. And that lie that you and I are going to hatch is this. Everybody who is a resident of the town of Longford, every individual in Longford, they move about the town walking on all fours, hands and knees like a dog. In other words, nobody walks around Longford Town standing upright. So if they're jogging, they jog on all fours. If they're going into the petrol station, they do that on all fours. If they, the children who go to school do it on all fours. All of the pubs, they are all walking around, not upright, but on all fours, hands and knees. That's the lie you and I want to spread around the world. That's the big Longford lie. Now think about that. If you and I wanted to spread that lie around the world, more than likely, we will go to some place far away, like maybe Russia, we would start in Russia. 
Or maybe we would start that down in Australia. Maybe possibly we would go to the far western side of Canada and try to start that line. Or maybe somewhere down in the, the southern tip of Brazil. One thing you and I would not do is try to start that line in the Republic of Ireland. And one thing you and I certainly would not do is go into Longford Town in front of the Longford Arms Hotel and try to begin convincing people of that lie. Why wouldn't we do that? Because the people in Longford Town would look at you as if you are insane and you would be insane for trying to do that. Because they would say to themselves, you're trying to convince me that the people in Longford Town, they go everywhere when on force. Show me one person who's actually doing that right now. Look across the street, show me one person who's doing that right now. You wouldn't start a lie about Longford Town in Longford Town. If the resurrection was a hoax, the disciples would have started that lie in Jerusalem, preaching the resurrection. And don't you think the people of that town would have been able to defeat that lie almost immediately? It could not have been a hoax because of where they started the preaching. They started in the same town that the same city that the resurrection happened. And there is no body and no evidence to go against the claims of Holy Scripture. So we come now to the second part of this presentation. And what I want to do in this second part is look at the theories that are out there. There are theories of doubt. So when you hear people talk about the fact that Jesus didn't really rise from the dead, what theories do they bring to the table? So I, I thought that these questions would be asked anyhow. So I said it may be best to actually air them out in the open and look at them one by one so that we can see what these theories are. First, we're going to start with the wrong tomb theory. Then goes the hallucination theory. Then we're going to look at the swoon theory, uh, the stolen body theory, and the sleeping soldiers theory. We're going to look at each one of them in turn. And it's going to be very simple. It's not complicated to, to disprove these theories at all. So first of all, let's start, start with the wrong tomb theory. What does the wrong tomb theory say? It says that though, those who hold this position, they assert that according to the gospel accounts, which is correct, the women visited the grave early in the morning while it was dark. And you can find that in, in John's gospel. That is true. But here's where, they, here's where they turn. They say because of their extreme emotionalism, uh, speaking about the women, ladies, don't get mad at me. This is what the folks who are uh, support the wrong tomb theory say. This is not what I'm saying. This is what they say. They say because of their extreme emotionalism and also because of the darkness at the time, they visited the wrong tomb. So overjoyed to see that it was empty, they rushed back to tell the disciples Jesus had risen. And according to the wrong tomb theory, the disciples immediately ran into Jerusalem and began preaching the resurrection. So the theory goes. Now, obviously, there are several problems with this theory. I want to look at just a few, the most obvious ones. Number one, it is highly unlikely highly unlikely that the apostles would not have corrected the woman's error. As a matter of fact, what we see in scripture is that this, the disciples go to the tomb for themselves right after the ladies told them in order to substantiate their claims that the body was no longer there. John 20 verse one to nine, it says, now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. There you see there, it was dark. And saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out and the other disciple, who was John, by the way, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus's head, 
not lying with the linen cloths, but folded in a place by itself. Then the other disciples, then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet, they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. Number two, the tomb site was known not only by the followers of Christ, of course, but also by their enemies. The gospels make it clear that the body was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, as we already saw. And he's a member, he was a member of the Jewish council. Thinking cap moment. If the body still remained in the tomb, while the apostles began preaching the resurrection, according to the, the, this theory, the authorities simply would have to go to the right tomb, produce the body, and march it down the streets. Now, some people may say that sounds quite cruel, but please remember that these are the same individuals who have already crucified Jesus for hours on the cross and watched him die. So they could have done that. There's no reason why they would not have done that. This would have been the nail in the coffin of Christianity. All, and that's supposed to be resurrection, all resurrection talks would have been squelched immediately. So wrong tomb theory, no way. Secondly, the hallucina hallucination theory. Say that 10 times fast, Hall hallucination theory. Here we go. According to this theory, the resurrection occurred only in the minds of the apostles. So it's only in their minds. This theory was made popular by an individual named Dr. William McNeil. He gave this explanation in his world history book. So here's what uh, Dr. William McNeil said, and this is how this theory became popular. It says the Roman authorities in Jerusalem arrested and crucified Jesus. But soon afterward, the dispirited apostles gathered in an upstairs room and suddenly they felt again the heartwarming presence of their master. This seemed absolutely convincing evidence that Jesus's death on the cross had, been the, had not been the end, but the beginning. The apostles bubbled over with excitement and tried to explain to all who would listen all that had happened. So goes the hallucination theory. That's what took place according to that theory. So there are several reasons why this is a weak theory. Firstly, even modern psychiatrists agree that several conditions must exist in order for hallucinations to take place. Hallucinations usually take place in people who are imaginative and of a nervous makeup. However, the appearance of Jesus occurred to a variety of people, different kinds of people of different ages, different genders, not only one specific individual or one specific type of person saw Jesus Christ resurrected, different people of different personalities and temperaments. You see, hallucinations are subjective and individual. No two people have the exact same experience when it comes to hallucinations. In the situation of Jesus's resurrection, over 500 people have the exact same account. Folks, 500 people are not going to hallucinate and hallucinate about the same thing happening. That doesn't happen. And it says it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 6. It says, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, at one time, 500 people together saw Jesus Christ after he was resurrected, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. So when Paul wrote this, what he was saying to these Corinthian believers is that if you don't believe me, you can actually ratify it for yourself. These people are still alive. Some were dead, they've fallen asleep, but some were still alive. Number two, hallucinations also occur only at particular times and places and are associated with the events. The resurrection appearances occur in many different environments and at many different times. Thirdly, hallucinations of this kind take place in those who desperately want to believe. 
However, several such as Thomas were even hostile to the news of the resurrection. Even Thomas, Jesus' own disciple was hostile to it. In John chapter 20, verse 24 to 28, here's what it says in scripture. Now Thomas, one of the 12 called twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord, but he, meaning Thomas said to them, unless I see his hands, see in his hands, sorry, the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hands into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were going in, were, were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Fourthly, those who want to maintain this position in spite of the obvious evidence must still explain the empty tomb. If the apostles were only fantasizing about the resurrection at their, at their preaching, all the authorities needed to do again was to produce the body. And that would have been the end of their fantasizing. The next theory, I think this is the third one now, is the swoon theory. These theories get more interesting as we go along. To me, this is the most interesting one, but here goes. According to this theory, Jesus never really died on the cross, but he merely fell unconscious and was mistakenly considered dead. And then three days later, he revived. He exited the tomb and appeared to his disciples who believed he had risen from the dead. Uh, this theory is not believable for several reasons. First, it was physically impossible for Jesus to survive the, the tortures of the resurrection. You see, these soldiers who crucified Jesus, these Roman soldiers, they were experts in executing this type of death penalty. Jesus was not the first person to ever have been crucified. This was a Roman, a Roman form of, of, of persecution. Many had succumbed to this penalty before Jesus did, which meant that the soldiers were experts at their job. The Roman soldiers were as familiar with the process of crucifixion as the Irish are with drinking tea. That's the familiarity of it. Secondly, they took several precautions to make sure Jesus was actually dead. They thrust a spear in his side, that's recorded in John 19, 34. And when the blood and water came out separately, this indicated that the blood cells had begun to separate from the plasma, which will only happen, in, happen when the blood stops circulating. According to medical professionals, that's what happens when blood stops circulating. You can see the blood and the water separately. Upon deciding to break the legs of the criminals in order to speed up their process of dying, they carefully examined the body of Jesus and found that he was already dead. Thirdly, after being taken down from the cross, Jesus was covered with about 75 pounds of spices and embalmed. That's recorded in John 19:39. It is highly unreasonable to believe that after three days without any food, without any water, Jesus would recover. And it's even harder to believe that Jesus could actually, if he did recover, roll a two-ton stone away. A two-ton stone is around 4,000 pounds. Then overpower the guards and then walk several miles to Emmaus. Here's what David F. Strauss says. Now, David F. Strauss was, a, was an antagonist of Christianity. He, he hated Christianity. But here's what he said concerning the resurrection and regarding particularly this theory called the swoon theory. He said, quote, it is impossible that a being who had stolen half dead out of the sepulcher would creep, sorry, who crept out weak and ill wanting medical treatment 
who were required bandaging, strengthening, and indulgence, and who still at last yielded to his sufferings, could have given the disciples the impression that he was a conqueror over death and the grave, the prince of life, an impression that would lay at the bottom of their future ministry. Close quote. Even the unbeliever says, there's no way Jesus Christ could inspire anybody to think that he was the prince of life, that he conquered death in that kind of state. Anyone who supports this theory is not a true friend of logic. The next theory is the stolen body theory. According to this theory, the Jewish and the Roman authorities, instead of the disciples, this makes it different from what I was talking about earlier. Earlier, I was talking about the disciples stealing the body, but here it's the Jewish and Roman authorities. They stole the body and moved it for safekeeping. Now, several options make this a foolish theory. Number one, it is inconceivable to think that this is a possibility because if they had the body, why did they need to accuse the disciples of stealing the body? In Matthew, they accused the disciples of stealing it. Why accuse them of stealing it if they had the body? If we go to Acts chapter 4, verse 1 to 5, the Jewish authorities there were agitated and did everything they could to prevent the spread of Christianity. On that particular occasion, the disciples were explicitly, and it says this in, I think, verse 2 of that chapter, they were explicitly, maybe verse 3, they were explicitly preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ on that particular day. If the Jewish authorities really knew where the body was and they had gone and just stolen it, they could have exposed it the body and ended the faith that caused them so much trouble and embarrassment. And the final theory is the sleeping soldiers theory. Now this theory is the oldest of all the theories because it has existed since the time of the resurrection. And it's actually recorded in scripture, Matthew 28 verse 12 to 13 is what it says. It says, and when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a su sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, tell the people, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. Now, many people are actually surprised that Matthew records this and does not even refute it in the text. Why didn't Matthew say anything to refute this in the text? But perhaps it's because this exp explanation was so preposterous, so unbelievable, he did not see the need to even do so. This theory appears erroneous for several reasons. Number one, if the soldiers were sleeping, <laughs> how did they know it was this, the disciples who stole the body? <laughs> this is the most obvious problem with this theory. And those who used it were so frantic, they didn't know what to do, that they probably didn't even process and think through how self-defeating these claims were. If the soldiers were sleeping, how could you accuse the apostles? And number two, it seems physically impossible for the disciples to sneak past the soldiers, then move a 4,000 pound stone in absolute silence if they were sleeping. Certainly the guards would have heard something. A stone that large would have required most of the disciples to be present. And that would have resulted in more noise to get the task done. Number three, let's also remember that according to Matthew 27, 66, the tomb was sealed. The unsealing of a tomb could never take place in silence. Furthermore, anyone who moved the stone would break the seal, an offense which was punishable by death. The despair and timidity of the apostles make it quite difficult to believe that they would suddenly become so fearless as to face a group of probably the best soldiers. More than likely they were the best soldiers because you don't put uh, newcomers on this kind of job, probably the best soldiers. They would steal the body and then lie about the resurrection when they would ultimately face a life of suffering and death for the sake of this message. Finally, if the Gospel of John, sorry, in the Gospel of John, the grave clothes were found lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus's head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen, as we already saw in John. 
there was insufficient time for these disciples to sneak quietly past the guards. Roll away the stone, if they could, in silence. Unwrap the body, then rewrap it in their wrappings and fold the headpiece neatly next to the linen. In a robbery, you don't do those things. In a robbery, what you do is you fling everything down in this order and just take your prized possession. There's no way they could have done this without being detected. So we have our conclusion. Not one of these theories are able to account for the empty tomb, the first evidence, the transformation of the apostles, which was the second evidence, and the birth of Christianity in the exact city of the crucifixion itself. The conclusion we must draw is that Jesus Christ truly rose from the dead. Anyone who does not support such a position is really a stranger to common sense and logic. The implications of this are immense. Firstly, if Jesus rose from the dead, then what he said about himself is true. He stated, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. He also stated that I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. Eternal life is found only through placing your confidence in the finished work of Jesus Christ alone. Any other religious belief that contradicts this is false and must be abandoned immediately. Every other religion and every other religious leader has been buried in a grave and they remain there to this very day. Only one person, Jesus Christ, the son of God, conquered death. And then secondly, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 54, he says, death has been swallowed up in victory. Physical death is not the end for anybody. Eternal life with our Lord is what awaits all who trust in Jesus Christ because he has conquered death. Every human being will physically die one day. If you want to be raised to eternal life after death, you must trust in the one who first raised himself as the example. So what's the moral of the story? The moral of the story is only two words. He's alive. He is alive and he is alive forevermore. Thank you folks very much. Thank you so much, Pastor O'Neill. Mm -hmm. That was very thorough and that was very, very excellent. And I enjoyed that very much. So to this point that uh, what we want to do is turn it over to you guys and uh, see if there are questions that maybe have arisen out of uh, what we've just heard. <clears throat> and if so, uh, by all means, feel free to unmute yourself and ask those questions now. And uh, otherwise you can put those in the chat box and we will, we will be your mouthpiece. So we'll pause just for a second here, see if there are any questions. While you're thinking of yours, uh, there is one question that's, that's come in. And I think you might've touched on this uh, Pastor Neil, when you were discussing there, uh, so your proof for the resurrection, but you mentioned that the apostles and the disciples died for their faith, right? Most of them in a very horrific way. But I suppose other people of other religions have died for their faith as well. Why is the fact that the disciples died so compelling in terms of your argument for the validity of the resurrection? I would say it's because of the fact that we're talking about the resurrection itself, because the issue on the table is, did Jesus Christ really rise from the dead? If Jesus Christ hadn't risen from the dead, Christianity would have been defeated. When we look at the resurrection and its attachment to Christianity and also its attachment to the change within the disciples, obviously the resurrection had an impact because there's nothing else that could have changed these cowardly men 
these men who during his trial, you know, fled. Peter, you know, Kirsten said, I don't know the man. For them to have such a, a transformative change almost immediately, well, not immediately, but three, three days after, it was just, it's just mind boggling when you think about it and you look at the evidence from scripture with regards to people from other religions, uh, the, the difference is a lot of times those people in most cases, they don't, number one, they're the people of their faith, their, their gods have not been resurrected from the dead. And number two, those people are convinced those people in those other situations, they're sincere, but unfortunately they're sincerely wrong because they're, when it comes to their savior, there's no proof of their savior being resurrected from the dead in any way. So they're building their hope upon a web of lies. And that's, that's what uh, is so significant and so different between Christianity the Lord Jesus Christ and a lot of these other faiths, even though those individuals would be willing to suffer and die for their quote unquote religion, they are just yeah building their foundation on a on a spider's web, really. So that's good. Thank you very much. That's good. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate that very much. You know, the fact that you know people will die for a lie. You know, people will fly planes into a you know skyscraper. Uh, for uh, a lie of, of their religion, but but it would it would be something spectacular for someone to actually die for something that they knew was actually a lie. And I think you touched on that in your presentation. I, pre I appreciate that very much. Any any other questions out there uh, from you all? Got a good crowd assembled here. Yeah. Um, who gave Jesus um? A new clothes after he uh, rose from the dead. Yeah, who gave Jesus new clothes after he arose from the dead? Yeah, um, I assume that's Matthew. Matthew, I'm not quite sure. I would assume, I would assume that it was his apostles uh, because he appeared to his apostles. And so he appeared in many instances and spent time with them. We don't know how long the Bible doesn't say, but I would assume that it's quite possible that even if, he, <laughs> you know, you think about some things I never thought about, but if he did get new clothes, I, I never thought that deeply, but if he did get new clothes, maybe, maybe it, more than likely it was his apostles. But in reality, Matthew, the Bible doesn't really, say that he yeah got new clothes maybe oh i i think i know what you're saying you're probably saying because jesus christ died his clothes were apparently or what he was what he was wrapped in was left in the tomb speaking about the different pieces of cloth pieces of cloth how did he get new clothes and appeared to people when he resurrected. Okay, I think I know where you're going with that question now, Matthew. Um, that's actually a good question. I've never thought of that, but I would assume, like you are probably assuming that when Jesus Christ appeared to the women uh, and appeared to the apostles in the house there that he was dressed and clothed, I would assume so. The Bible doesn't say that he was, but I assume so. Uh, but the situation is that when Jesus Christ arose from the dead, he was in a state whereby really he was in need of nothing. So, I mean, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. I think clothes was probably not even an issue. As he arose, he arose victorious. He arose as king, not that he wasn't king before, but he arose proving that he was who he said he was. So in the magnificence of himself and the fact that he owns everything, yeah, it could be that he just had new clothes, but he, because he is, uh, you know, the king of heaven. I don't think anybody needed to actually give him clothes because is Jesus Christ, then really he, he had no need, especially not then after his resurrection. He was in his glorified state. He was um, the resurrected Christ. So maybe there was no need for him to actually have anybody 
give him or present to him new clothes. I would assume that the clothes that he got were just his or maybe the father in heaven gave it to him. Who knows? Yeah, just uh, be, be praying for the Sunday school teachers at Hope Community Church. These are the types of deep theological questions that our Sunday school teachers here get all the time. Yeah. So Matthew's yeah. a great question. Let's not forget uh, that Jesus Christ spoke the world into creation. So it would probably be uh, much less difficult for him to uh, speak new clothes into creation if he needed those once he left the, uh, uh, the empty tomb as well. But that's a good question. It's a good question. Any others out there? Reham, any questions from you? Yeah, go ahead, Noel. Yeah, I was about to say, you know, the, 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 the word speaks of us uh, being clothed in robes of righteousness, all of us at that time. And it seems to me that our, our brother, our brother Christ, would certainly be modeling that type of garment. It, as, as, as Pastor O'Neill said, uh, it, it, it may be symbolic, you know, uh, that these, we will all be dressed in clothes of righteousness. We'll be wearing the clothes of righteousness uh, at that time. And that will be, a, you know, at the time when we pass into glory. He was equally passing into his glory of his father. And so, you know, I think it's a very good question. I th you know, I really, uh, I, I admire your efforts <laughs> to, to get around it. But it seems to me that we take it that, uh, you know, these robes of righteousness will be our right as righteous children of the living God. And so I, I don't, I, I think we, we can all be comfortable about it. Uh, what, there, there isn't going to be a tailor waiting around. Uh, Ronnie, there might be a hairdresser, but there won't be any tailors hanging around uh, for uh, uh, to, to, to clothe us all. I don't think uh, we need to worry too much about our clothing at that, on that day. We don't need to worry about that. But, but it is a good question. And yes, I, I, I really do admire the fortitude of our of our teachers, our Sunday school teachers, uh, to, that they have to deal with such a very uh, immense questions. And it's, so thank you again, Matthew. Yeah. Thank you, Noel, for your input. We appreciate it. I have go a ahead, question. Nathan. Yeah, go ahead, Nathan. There's one worldview that uh, says that somebody like Jesus died, but Jesus himself didn't die. How do you answer that question? Yeah, I've never heard of that uh, worldview, that somebody like Jesus died, but Jesus Christ himself didn't die. Um, I would just say that that worldview, I mean, I would say it's a lie because the first week we spoke, we spoke about the fact we asked the question, can we trust the Bible? And we came to the conclusion after that presentation that we can trust the Bible. And so the Bible is to be trusted, trusted and valued above all other um, books, all other documents, all other worldviews, because the Bible has proven itself to be true. Even over time, it's proven itself to be true. So I, I've never heard of that. I'm sure there, I'm sure that's been said many times, but I, I don't know who that individual is, but scripture records it. And yeah, I, I've never heard of, of anything else um, contrary to that. Okay, because that worldview also says that Jesus just ascended to heaven. He never really died. So uh, just to clarify, I believe that Jesus died and, and we have uh, our hope is based on that. If we if he didn't die and, and rise from the dead, we are of all men most miserable because we have nothing at the end to yeah. hang our hat on. Uh, we're hopeless. So. I'm so sorry. I didn't realize I was muted. I am terribly sorry. When it comes to that worldview, thanks, ladies. When it comes to that worldview, if you do know the, the answer, I, I'd like to, to find out. Do they believe Jesus Christ was crucified? Do they say he was crucified and then he just ascended to heaven or he was never crucified at all? Never, never crucified at all. Somebody like him died. 
but he oh, was okay. never crucified. Okay, interesting. Well, uh, <clears throat> to add to that, I would go back again <laughs> to the to the first week and say that there are, in addition to the scriptures, of course, the, the Bible is enough, but in addition to the scriptures, there are other historical documents. We go back to Josephus and Josephus mentions the fact that, um, you know, he was crucified. Uh, he did say, uh, uh, you know, during that time that According to the Jews, he was crucified because he did some kind of sorcery, whatever the case may be, but it mentions his crucifixion. There's another first century writer. I can't remember if, if it was Suetonius or Tacitus, but it talked about the execution of the wise king of the Jews. So again, that, that is a reference in addition to the Bible. That is, you know, those people that those texts weren't written by Christians. They were people who hated Christianity, but they were just recording history, and that's what they recorded. So there is other uh, historical evidence in addition to the Bible that actually speaks about the crucifixion itself. So Josephus talks about it. I, I'm not sure which Roman it, it was. It was either Pliny the Younger or Tacitus. For some reason, I feel that it is Tacitus, but they, they spoke about the, the crucifixion as well and the execution of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good, good question, Nathan. I hadn't uh, specifically heard that either, but the reality is anyone can claim anything Right. And, that, and that's really what tonight has been, you know, any, we could, as, as Christians, we can say Jesus rose from the dead. But what we've been able to present tonight and here is, you know, the internal and the external evidence from the scriptures and outside the scriptures. You know, wasn't it just, you know, this this event was just suddenly happened or allegedly happened and people started spreading the story. Jesus's death and resurrection was actually prophesied in the scripture. Mm -hmm. Eyewitness, you know, eyewitnesses to the resurrection. And then again, you look at you look at these apostles who gave their very lives uh, for the reality and the truth that they knew was true that he rose from the dead. So I would place the burden of proof on that other worldview, substantiate your claim, and you know compare the evidence of that claim versus the evidence that we've uh, shared tonight, which, as thorough as it's been, is really scratching the surface in some ways of the evidence that's actually out there. So, so thank you for your question. Thank you, Nathan. Thank we you. greatly appreciate it. Yeah. Why then, one quick question in the chat is, why then did Jesus say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then it is finished before the resurrection. Why? Qu question for the person who asked that question, why then did Jesus say, what is the purpose of the then there? You're asking that question as opposed to what? Why did Jesus say that? You just asking why did Jesus just say ask, that? asking, yeah. Um, he's asking why uh, Jesus said that because the price was paid for sin. Uh, my God, my God, why has you forsaken me? Was out of the pure anguish that he was experiencing on the cross at that time. I think only eternity will reveal not only the physical pain that Jesus went through, but the spiritual pain that Jesus went through. When Jesus was on the cross, was on the cross, God was on the cross. So you have the Trinity, God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. Now that is a mystery in and of itself. But imagine one of those, God, the Son, actually coming to a point where he's ceasing to exist, because we believe Jesus literally did die. He wasn't swooned, he literally died on the cross. So imagine the, <laughs> I don't even know how to verbalize that. Imagine the separation, the, the, the feeling of what Jesus Christ went through concerning his situation because the God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Spirit had been a Trinity for all eternity and up and they had been like that for all eternity up until this point. And at this point, Jesus Christ was dying. So of course there was physical pain there and that was torturous and that was horrendous. But I think more horrendous than the physical pain was the spiritual pain that Jesus Christ was feeling as he was being, I guess in a sense, it's hard for me to say this without thinking about the theological implications, but being 
not a part of the Trinity or not not a part of the Trinity, but being dead as a part of the Trinity is the best way I can verbalize it. It's the best way that I can verbalize it. So my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's part of the spiritual anguish that Jesus Christ was going through at the time. And to be able to put that into human terms, I think is impossible uh, on this part, on this side of eternity. And then it is finished would be the price is paid. Jesus Christ had said that he was going to die that he would die this death for sin, and he did that. So it is finished. Yeah, it was finished. Yeah, the, the, we, we, the separation from the Father. He was taking in sin, the sins of the world are sin, and God cannot stand sin, cannot take in his presence, and so he had to be cut off from the Father. From the Trinity set uh, for a short period of time as he took on our sin on the cross. And so that's why the pain, he felt the pain of, of, of being forsake, forsaken. It was a very wise sounding man that made those comments there, Pastor O'Neill. Yeah, uh, he is. Yeah, he is. Very, <laughs> yeah you know, I, we, we sing this uh, sort of modern day hymn, hymn in Christ alone as a phrase in that song, till on the cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. And we often can, if, if we're not careful, and I think Pastor O'Neill's done a great job of, of separating this two, as well as uh, Mr. Uh, Russell there in the Bahamas. What was that wrath of God that Jesus experienced? It really wasn't the crown of thorns. It really wasn't the nails in his hand. It really wasn't the beating that man placed on him. It was that separation of communion from the remainder of the Trinity. That was what was so excruciating and painful for Jesus to endure. God the Father literally turned his back on his son and he'd never experienced that. That, that, that was the wrath of God. And, and, and that is honestly, you know, we think about the wrath to come, yes, there's going to be, you know, physical uh, punishment uh, for those who die in their sin, but but that that real torture is going to be separated from everything that is good about God, everything. You know, uh, we think about the grace of God in our lives, just in just in our very existence, our hearts are beating, we can breathe in and out. Imagine imagine God's grace just being completely removed from that and how torturous that would be that that is really the, the the wrath of god to you know to to be completely disconnected from any aspect of the grace graciousness and goodness uh, of god and he did all of that to take the punishment for those who would believe and once he had endured that sufficiently according to the father as O'Neill said that's that was it was finished the, the price was paid paid in full so good So another question out there. Uh, the disciples after the res resurrection, uh, how come they didn't recognize Jesus? Say that one more time. I caught your question at the end. Say that one more time, please. Uh, how come the disciples didn't recognize Jesus after the resurrection? When is this you're talking about? When he appeared to them afterwards. Yeah, do, do you have a text for me? You know. I know the situation of the uh, gentlemen who were on the road to Emmaus. I know they didn't recognize Jesus Christ at, uh, on, on, in that situation, but it sounds like, like you're talking specifically about the apostles. So I don't want to get it mixed up. And yeah, I think I think possibly the road to Emmaus. I think also you know there's a, Mary Magdalene was there. She thought it was, Jesus was the gardener as well. Yeah. So there was a bit of uh, uncertainty there. Would would it be in Mark nine thirty two? Mark nine thirty two. Yeah. 
they went on from there and passed through Galilee and he did not want anyone to know for he was teaching his disciples saying to them the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him and when he is killed after three days he will rise but they did not understand saying they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him okay now, now when I when I see that there, I, I don't see that as the disciples not recognizing who Jesus was. I don't see anything in the text right. that says that the disciples did not recognize Jesus because this is uh, before, yep, definitely before the, the crucifixion and the resurrection. So, and I, I don't see anything that hints in the text. I do see that they did not understand the saying and they were afraid to ask him, but I don't think, see anything in the text that suggests that they were, they didn't recognize who he was after the resurrection. I, I, I think if there is a connection to that text and many more like that to where Jesus often uh, predicted his resurrection, but the disciples didn't get it, right? Yeah. He said, this is gonna happen, you know, you know, pray, be of good courage, you know, all of us, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, Go to Jerusalem. I must go. It's been appointed for me to die, to, to be in the tomb for three days, and then to, to rise again. But it clearly here it says they did not understand what he was saying. So, so I think there might, if there's any connection to that text, uh, Brother Ron, it would be that. And again, this this goes back and underscores some of the other evidence that O'Neill shared with us earlier. Uh, the disciples they thought Jesus was gone and gone for good that's what that's what the on the, the road to Emmaus was all about didn't you hear this guy who was supposed to be our messiah he came and he's dead and he's gone mm. I don't know if you've ever had the experience to where you've 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 seen someone that you know but you see them out of context <laughs> like you yes. see them somewhere you've never seen them. maybe you're traveling far away and they just happen to be there too and you go you don't recognize them at first right because you're just not simply expecting to see them so I think yeah. that could be part of it is, you know, the, and I don't think it's specifically maybe the road to Emmaus here, you know, they're like, <laughs> they're so downhearted, you know, that, that Jesus is dead and, and, and they're really bummed out about it. So why in the world would they expect that to be Jesus? Now, again, that's, that's probably as much speculation on my part as it is actual anything that the Bible tells us. That yeah. As to why they didn't recognize probably be part of it. I didn't hear that. Say that again, Ludi. Which which part? <laughs> what, what did you say there? That you, know, you broke up. Did you ask yeah, me something? I, well, no. I'll, I'll I'll try to. Sorry, sorry. Uh, I I don't think I asked. I don't think I asked anything. I uh, I just. Uh um, was uh, was just commenting there that it could just be the the actual surprise and 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 the lack of expect yes uh, of seeing Jesus that so perhaps they didn't recognize him there comment there uh, in the chat box too is 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 we not forget as well he was he was in his glorified body post resurrection as well so maybe there was a difference in appearance there yeah. right. I think that's a, that's an excellent point as well. Good point. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your question. You're welcome. Yeah. Other questions? What's the question? Um, why do Christians um, not do Easter egg bunnies? See, these are, these are the questions that always stump us. It's the Sunday school guys. Okay, no more Sunday school people allowed to come. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> great. Rebecca, very, 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 very good question. 
Um, here's, here's, here's the truth about that. Um, Rebecca, some, some Christians do participate in those things, right? Some people do, uh, some Christians do, um, you know, have chocolate eggs and, and you know, go, go see the Easter bunny and, and all of those things. I think uh, the, a Christian needs to be very, very careful, though, how much they embrace uh, those things. Uh, because the reality is it, those things have kind of came in and they've actually overtaken and they've been, you know, for most people, I think that might be a fair way to say it. For most people, that's all Easter is about. It's about a bunny coming and bringing chocolate and eggs and all of these things. And no one ever mentions the things that we've been talking about all day here at Hope Community Church. Jesus dying on the cross on Good Friday, raising back to life on uh, Easter Sunday. Uh, and, uh, you know, that gets lost sometimes when it all totally becomes about um, eggs and, 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 and sweets and, and, and chocolate. And so I would just say uh, to anyone who's, who's doing that, particularly those if they, if they are Christians doing that, going, what, are, what is Easter really all about? And, and okay, you might want to have a little bit of fun. You might want to enjoy some chocolate. You might want to play, you know, all of those things that the world does. But uh, be very, very careful that you don't, uh, you don't allow those things to become what you look forward to and what you celebrate most uh, about uh, Easter. Uh, and if, and if, that, if that's it, I would say, you know, I would tell that person they need to really think, rethink uh, the way they observe and to celebrate this holiday. Because again, it's, it's kind of like Christmas. Christmas has become all about lights and presents and Santa and, and all of these things, right? And, yeah. and, and those things, you know, it's, it's nice to give gifts and, and all of these things, but the reality is we got to remember what Christmas is, is all about. Even more so uh, Easter, right? This is the most important, as O'Neill said, most important event that's ever happened in the history of the world. The Bible says, if this event didn't happen, Nathan said it earlier, we are the most pitiful people on the planet because our faith is completely futile. So if you had an Easter egg today, I hope you enjoyed it. But I hope you enjoyed remembering the resurrection of Christ more. I hope, I hope that answers uh, your question. Yeah. I have one more question. Go ahead. Um, just a clarification. It's not a question of doubt, but uh, how do, how can you explain to me? I know the Bible says that Jesus was in the tomb for three days. If he died Friday and rose Sunday morning, I never understood that. So I'd like to know what you say about that. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot of people have had that question. So in the Jewish way of thinking, they counted a day not as, well, let me put it this way. When, when they said a day, it didn't necessarily have to be an entire 24-hour period for them to say it was a, a day. They don't necessarily mean three whole full 24-hour periods. Even if it was the evening they would have counted it a day in Jewish tradition. So because he was there Friday, Saturday, and then part of Sunday, that would have been considered a day. So it doesn't necessarily mean that Jesus Christ was in the grave for full 24 hour periods, three of them. Okay. So a, lo a lot of people uh, get tripped up, tripped up over that, but that's that's the situation behind that. Because even, even today, we, we sort of do the same thing, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm heading on holidays three days from now. That doesn't necessarily mean I'm heading on holidays three 24 hour periods from now. It, it could just mean I'm heading on holidays on, what's that? Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday. Yeah, Tuesday or Wednesday. Yeah. It's too late for math. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for your question. Anybody else? 
I have a question. Can I ask one? Go ahead. I was just gonna, gonna ask, like you know, um, uh, when you first rose, and they said, "Don't, don't touch, um, don't touch me yet," because I haven't returned to my father yet. Is that talking about the glorified body? Is I, why, why was that so? I think it was with Mary. I, I'm not 100 percent sure. I should actually look it up. I was gonna save it for Thursday, but I thought I'd ask there. Yeah. If if you could uh, find that tax for me, I'd really appreciate that. Please. I'll see if I can look it up. Hold it for me. <clears throat> um, John twenty, verse seventeen. Yeah. <clears throat> Because he had not yet his glorified body, I think. Maybe because you guys were talking about his glorified body. I was just wondering. Okay, so I, I always like to get reading earlier for the sake of context. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener. Okay, this is that text. She said to him, sir, if you have if yeah, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and announced, the, announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And he said these things, and that he had said these things to her. Yes, yeah, so you're asking about great uh, verse 17. Do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to the father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father. Um, so just- uh, uh, I was just gonna say, King Henry verse 16, do not touch me. Yeah, correct, yeah. So I, th I think the, the issue here is that when, depending on which version you read, you may get a, a different understanding of the text. So when I read verse 17 in the ESV, it says, do not cling to me. Now the word cling gives a different idea. And I would say more than likely that's a better translation of that word. I don't have any of my, forgive me, I don't have any of my tools before me whereby I could look at the Greek. I don't know if Ludi has this, but the word cling gives a different idea. So be, because I think maybe cling is more of the intention of what the word is here it suggests that he didn't want Mary to actually be attached to him because he, he wasn't going to be staying for long. He wasn't, even though he was alive, he still had a purpose or an eye of headed, heading back to the father. So there is no means whereby he was going to be staying here. And that word cling gives off that idea. Mary, I mean, could you imagine? Could you imagine being in that situation? Jesus was dead three days ago. You come to the situation of the tomb being uh, empty. She's, it says she was weeping, correct? Um, yeah, Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? So weeping is not just, you know, you know, sometimes some tears rolling down oh. someone's eyes. It's, it's, you know, it's like you're being at a funeral and you're you're weeping, oh, that's, you know, the wail and everything like that. So because of the emotional state, I could think, you know, the, the past three days, what she has been going through, what the disciples have struggled with, more than likely they were talking to one another in secret and all of these things. And then finally, and unsuspectingly, she sees Jesus alive because she also thought that, you know, somebody took the body. She oh. sees Jesus alive and now, the first reaction is to latch on to Jesus and never let him go. That's probably what she's thinking. And that's probably what uh, Jesus is addressing here. You know, don't cling to me because I am not 
going to be here long, even though he was going to appear and show to others that he was resurrected. He didn't want Mary to become attached and think that things are going to continue as normal. No, eventually I'm going to be going to my father. So please don't cling to me. You have to understand that I am here for now, but I'm not going to continuously be here. So that's why he, he brings in uh, the ascending to his father. And he also says to, to, he also tells her to go to, you know, the other disciples and tell them also that he's going to, to the father as well. So Mary, don't get too attached to me. It's that, so the word there probably is better translated cling than touch because Mary, God, sorry, Jesus probably wasn't saying, don't put your hands on me. Like that. Yeah, that is illustrated in the text. So that's just one of those. Yeah, King James Version thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. That's one. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. And then uh, what did I say? And um, he, sending to his father, he would have done it on Ascension Day, is it? Is that is that when he went yeah. to his father? Yes. Yeah. And they would saw him go, go going up. Yes. Heaven. Yeah. All right. Okay, thank you. No problem. There, there was a question in the chat earlier, is Jesus a man today in heaven? Uh, we see that, yes, Jesus ascended into heaven in bodily form. We see that Jesus is going to come back in bodily form. So we can only assume that Jesus is a physical uh, man in heaven uh, today, having been become incarnate at his uh, at his first coming this first corinthians 15 44 through 50 mean he cannot be a man in heaven won't do too deep of a dive in that because that's a little bit uh, outside of what we're talking about but what first corinthians 15 basically is saying is the natural man meaning us we cannot enter into heaven i said we must be born again we must die to self receive a spiritual regeneration but then in the end we will be also resurrected and receive glorified physical uh, bodies. So 1 Corinthians 15 doesn't really uh, dismiss uh, the possibility that Jesus is a man in heaven today. We've got to remember there's a new heaven and a new earth, a real tangible place, and we're going to be real people uh, occupying it. So thank you for that question too. Let's see, that's James uh, and Elaine. All right. The questions are coming a little less frequently now, so maybe you're getting tired. But uh, do feel free to, if you if you have another one uh, stirring in your minds, uh, I'll give you another opportunity in just a moment to ask that before we close up shop for the evening. But I want to do this, and this is specifically again for the people who are in the Longford area, especially. But if you're anywhere in Ireland, uh, we've been trying to give, give a free offer each week. We have this booklet here, uh, Why the Cross, written by a brother up in Northern Ireland. Very thorough uh, explanation as to the need for the cross, what was accomplished on the cross. Really is a good booklet to have just as a refresher of the gospel in mind. So we would uh, love to give you one of these. If you would like, we just need your details as to where to send this to. If you're outside of Ireland or if you're outside of Longford, well, daft.ie, you can go on, you can find a place to move to Longford and we'll be happy to send you one of these uh, at that point. And then, uh, but yeah, that's that's really just a local uh, offer there for hopefully what you would see as, as obvious reasons there. So um, just one other, I guess, uh, thing by way of announcement here before I turn it back over to you to see if there are any final questions there. This is the third of of four planned Honest Answer topics, uh, which means next week is, is the last scheduled topic that uh, we have planned. We're gonna be dealing with the answer, uh, trying to answer the question, uh, do all religions lead to God? It's a big question. We're gonna to try to give an honest answer to that uh, next week. Now, saying that's our final scheduled uh, discussion, can I just say that because of you all, and folks like you who have joined us these past four, three weeks, we've been greatly encouraged. We greatly enjoyed the exercise. Hopefully it's been helpful uh, in some way, shape or form to everybody who has participated. So we wanted to throw it over to you. Are there other big questions like these that we've been addressing that you have, that you want some answers to, or that you want some clarity on? Uh, if, if there are, uh, we're perfectly happy 
to uh, extend this honest answer series another week or two if, if it means that we're actually answering the questions that folks like you are asking or wanting help with answering. So um, if you have specific questions, do me a favor. If you know some now, you can put them in the chat box now. You can email us. You can send us a message on Facebook and we will, uh, we will take, uh, take stock in whatever feedback you give us. And uh, perhaps next week we can come back and announce to you maybe another week or two of honest answers. Um, but yeah, it's been a joy. It has been a joy and still a lot more fun to, to have together uh, even next week. So, but do let us know. Uh, it's your turn to uh, to decide what we do what we do next now. So, um, with that, I'm going to hand it back over to you all. Are there any final questions? We have one question that was just put into the chat box. I actually expected this question first because it's one that's <laughs> consistently asked when this subject is brought up and it's where was Jesus during the three days after he died, meaning while he was in the tomb for that time period before he resurrected, where was he, what was he doing? And the answer to that question is, the Bible does not say. <laughs> so there have been a lot of people who have speculated over the years as far as over the centuries, not the years, as far as what Jesus Christ was doing. There are theories out there. I mean, I've heard people go off and not many times, but I've heard people talk about this and that. But the reality of the situation is that the Bible doesn't tell us specifically what Jesus Christ was during, doing during those uh, three days, during those hours. That's a, an extended period of time. I don't know. And we cannot say with surety. I've heard one individual say that more than likely Jesus Christ was in heaven. And, and some of these you know, theories sound good. Jesus Christ was in heaven and there's the Ark of the Covenant in heaven and he was offering a blood sacrifice for each and every one of his children, everyone who would come to faith in Jesus Christ, past, present, and future. And that's what he was doing because Jesus Christ was, his logic is Jesus Christ was the great high priest. You hear theories uh, such as that. Of, of what Jesus Christ was doing. But the reality is the Bible does not say, so we cannot speak on that particular question with certainty. I would say, you know, there is a lot of speculation. What was Jesus doing these three days? Uh, I do think we get, you know, one, one glimmer of um, information in terms of at least, <laughs> at least what he was doing part of those days, and, and, and that was actually during the crucifixion itself, when the thief uh, on Jesus's right hand, you know, basically confessed that Jesus was Christ. And, and, and what did Jesus tell him? Today, you will be with me in paradise. So that, that gives us an indication, but, but there are all kinds of, you know, people say Jesus was in heaven, some say Jesus was in hell, you know, uh, preaching to the captive spirits there. They, they, they get that from a passage in First Peter, um, you know, but but apart from that one statement on the cross, the Bible doesn't give us, you know, that, that Jesus didn't take that thief and, and, and go, like, we don't know it. And, and some people try to uh, formulate their theology based on some of these other uh, challenging uh, passages. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the important thing is, in the midst of all of that speculation, Two things. Number one, Jesus on the cross said it is finished. The debt was paid. All that needed to be uh, uh, done for the forgiveness of sin, for the payment of sin was accomplished uh, on the cross. There was no need for Jesus to go and suffer in hell. Jesus suffered the wrath of God on the cross, right? So, so we, we don't need to affirm that he... Uh, he could he have visited hell and preached? Sure, he could he could he could do that. But but he did not suffer in hell. His his agony was on the cross. And into the uh, to our question tonight, Jesus Christ rose from the dead on the third day, proving that the sin debt had been paid, proving that he was the Son of God, proving that he has the righteousness to promise us our own resurrection uh, based on our faith uh, in him. So. 
Matthew, I see your comment in the chat box there, but I don't see a question related to that. So, pause there to see if there's one coming. Oh, what does that mean? <laughs> well, yeah, what does that mean? <laughs> well, yeah, it, it, it means other people uh, were resurrected. Uh, and that's not us trying to be uh, flippant about that answer, but, but apparently this, uh, this did happen. Um, again, this is one of those uh, passages that just the Bible states it as a fact. It doesn't give us a whole lot of backstory or narrative or explanation of it. But we do see here that uh, the bodies of the saints who had died arose. Uh, you know, Jesus said he was the first fruits of the resurrection. Um, you know, we who die in Christ are going to also have a bodily resurrection too in the end of time. Now, we don't know uh, these folks here who raised in Matthew 27, were they raised in their glorified bodies? Or was this a, a resuscitation and they died again awaiting the final resurrection? Matthew, we, we don't know. So, to answer your question specifically and directly, what does this mean? It means that other saints rose after Jesus uh, rose. All and right. Think, and just to add to that one more comment, I think when you look at a verse such as that, it proves the, how spectacular and how abnormal in the good sense that time was when we talk about the crucifixion, the uh, Jesus being on the cross and dying and the, the, the sun, the light of the sun failed. And then you see this situation happening here. There was nothing that was normal about this period of time. It was just absolutely Amazing. No wonder why we're still talking about it today. You know, all the, the events that occurred and the, the miraculous nature of the, the event was just astounding. Things could never be the same, even though everybody was not saved because of the death, burial, and resurrection of, the, of Christ, meaning not everybody received Jesus Christ. There is no way that time in history could pass and it not register for the rest of history. And I think uh, verses such as this actually bring to light the fact that there was so much going on that time. No wonder Josephus talks about it. No wonder you have secular sources who were not Christians, people who were not believers actually record this because the person of Jesus Christ, his ministry, his crucifixion and, and his resulting resurrection and all that surrounded it had to be recorded because there was nothing normal about that, that period of time. So when I see texts such as that, that, that's what comes to my mind as well. We're gonna figure out this mute unmute thing by the way in the week four, it kills us. <laughs> With that folks, uh, I wanna say thank you uh, for your time, your attention this evening, uh, for your participation. Again, let us know are there topics that you'd like us to uh, chat about uh, in the future. We'd be happy to entertain those. And uh, Lord willing, we'll be able to maybe next week announce uh, a new topic or two uh, to talk to you about. But for now, uh, may the Lord bless the rest of your Easter and uh, your week ahead, and uh, may the Lord bless you and, and bring you back to your local church family again uh, next Lord's Day. So good night. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for participating. We would love to, uh, love to see you next time. God bless you.